Welcome, everyone. My name is Mikey Mhenda. I'm honored to introduce our special guest. Dr. James J. Zogby is the founder and president of the Arab America Institute, a Washington, D.C.-based organization which serves as a political and policy research arm of the Arab American community. He's also the managing director of Zogby Research Services, which specializes in groundbreaking <clears throat> public opinion polling across the Arab world. Zogby is a lecturer and a scholar in Middle Eastern Affairs and visiting professor of social research and public polling at New York uh, University in Abu Dhabi. I don't think that that's true anymore. Is that true still? It's not true. That's not true. I mean, so it was true, but it was. I, I'm not doing it anymore yet. So, Dr. Zogby, you are a staple <laughs> of uh, Arab America, and, uh, and I would say American politics more broadly. It is an honor to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I guess, let, let me tell you first how I first came across your name, um, which is, I think, how a lot of people came across your name who are um, my age, which is in parentheses by, with Zogby poll, comma, year. But you didn't start off as a pollster, as far as I know. Um, tell us a little bit about what you studied in school um, and university, and when did you first become interested in, uh, in politics and in the Middle East? What I studied in school, well, that is a story in and of itself. Uh, sure. I started off as a math major. Um, I had a professor eight o'clock in the morning, freshman year, who spoke with a Chinese accent and I couldn't understand what he was saying. Um, eight o'clock in the morning didn't work with me anyway. Yeah. Uh, this was advanced calculus and analytics and I was like lost. Um, changed to economics, got my BA in economics, but my last year um, I focused on, on philosophy and I was looking around for an interdisciplinary um, uh, graduate program. <clears throat> and I found a religion program at Temple University um, and went there um, and never regretted it for a moment. It was an extraordinary opportunity to study uh, the religions of India, the early Christian church, Islam, <clears throat> which is what I ultimately focused on. Um, and I did then work. I took a year and a half off and went to University of Pennsylvania and did work in anthropology and Arabic language yeah. studies. Um, and uh, I guess I would say I'm, I'm a lifelong learner. And if I ever thought, um, I, I could never have imagined when I was 15, 25, 35, uh, that I'd be doing what I'm doing now. Um, mm -hmm. And I, when I was teaching, as I did for a number of years, I'd say to students, if you think you know today what you'll be 20 years from now, and that is what you become, you've led a boring life. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I've been lucky to be able to, to do, as my mom would say, I don't work. Um, I do what I enjoy. It's, it's not, it's not uh, uh, anything other than my passion that, that motivates me and I get paid for it. Um, <clears throat> when I got involved in the Middle East was, I, I should say, I went to Temple and I did the work I did at Temple in, in, in the graduate program. But what was more um, instructive for me in my life was the anti-war and civil rights movements uh, that were, um, I started in college with a former, a Jesuit passed away, Daniel Berrigan, known as the 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 you know the the priest who led uh, demonstrations against the war in Vietnam and went to jail many times and was an extraordinary extraordinary man um, and he shaped sort of the culture at the school that I was at uh, yeah. he was teaching there <clears throat> and I got involved in civil rights and anti war work and stayed and when I got to Philadelphia which was a hotbed for both um, I played a role in in both movements. Uh, and then in, I was doing my work, the, the side work in anthropology while I was doing the dissertation uh, prep work. And I, I was going to write on how stresses in culture produce changes in ideas. Um, and in particular, the birth of religious movements, you know, and I was looking at, through at the time Islam, and I was looking at Black America and the nation of Islam and the Moorish movement and all of those things that emerged in the 20s and 30s out of the, you know, the, the, 
the, the incredible stress that was being experienced in the country. There were lots of social movements that emerged then, but in the black community, there were these in particular. Anyway, I, I went to my anthropology professor, uh, Anthony Wallace, who had written the book, literally wrote the book on, on these movements called revitalization movements. And I said, this is what I'm gonna do. And he said, oh, he said, everybody's done that. He said, you have a knowledge of the Middle East and you've been you know, studying Islam. So why don't you do something with Palestinians? No, nobody has done anything with them. Uh, this was back in 1970, right? So um, I, yeah. uh, I said, let me take a look. Yeah. So I did. Um, and it was interesting because around the same time, my wife, I, I was studying for my comprehensives and my wife was reading, burying my heart at Wounded Knee about, about the Native Americans. And she was a loud reader. She would read and then say, oh my God, this is an outrage. Did you know what they did? They took their land. They kicked them off the land. They did this, they did that. And um, You're like, it sounds saying, familiar. I know, honey, but I got to study for the, the exams, my comprehensives. Um, and then the next book she picked up was by John Davies, uh, who was the first head of UNRWA. Um, yeah. And she said, this is the same story. It's they broke treaties, they took their land, they dispossessed them, they kicked them off the land. And she said, and these are your people and you're doing nothing about it. Well, you know, what, shouldn't you be doing something here too? So anyway, <clears throat> that and then Anthony Wallace motivating me, uh, pushed me in that direction. And um, I got a summer grant in, in um, 1971 to go to um, Lebanon to work in the refugee camps to collect stories, uh, to discuss how the, you know, to, to learn more about how the cultural stress, the social dislocation, uh, et cetera, had changed the ideas uh, uh, and the belief systems of people there. Uh, I spent weeks collecting stories and two things happened to me. One was at the very last day that I was doing my research, an old woman um, who I'd interviewed and spent time with came to me and she said, you're going. And she grabbed my arm and stared me in the eye. And she said, you've written down all our stories. What are you going to do with us now? Don't forget us. What are you going to do with us? You know, it's like, yeah, okay, I got it. Um, and then I went back to Beirut and Hassan Kenafani, who had helped me before I started in the camps um, and had given me a number of briefings on things. He said, tell me again what you're doing. And I told him how, you know, the stress of dislocation had produced changes and ideas. And so I went to the camps to collect stories and he said, no, you're in the wrong place. And I said, what do you mean? He said, he said, I know what you're trying to do. He said, but in the camps, people haven't changed ideas. They've frozen ideas. Hmm. They've romanticize the past um, that they want to go back to, but there's nothing new emerging. The place you want to go, the people you want to look at are the Arabs inside Israel, the, the Palestinian citizens of Israel. He said, look at Mahmoud Darwish and Tafik Zayed and Samuel Qasim. Um, and so I did. And I got to know those guys. And wow, it was... Um, uh, it was just fantastic to get to know Tafik uh, Zayed, just an amazing, amazing person. Um, so that's kind of how I got into this. And yeah. <clears throat> when I got back to the States, my, you know, my wife and I looked at each other on the flight on the way back saying our lives are never going to be the same again. And they weren't. I mean, I went from being a, somebody who had aspirations to be nothing more than maybe a college professor um, to somebody who wanted to do something to honor what that woman had said to me, uh, to not forget her and do something about it. Um, I, I, Ibrahim Abu Lughat and Edward Said discovered me while I was speaking at, a, at, a, at a, a, uh, an event in New York. And Ibrahim said, you're in the doctoral program? I said, yeah. He said, that's good. That's good. He said, but you really need to be in politics. And I said, uh, okay, what? And I was like, in my 20s, and they made me vice president of the Arab American University Graduates Group. Um, so I want to talk about this group. I'm so glad that you brought the, that up. So what year was that they, they discovered you? <laughs> that was in 73 or 4, yeah. 
Yeah. I'm sorry. It's a long, you asked no, me. No, 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 no. It's, how it's, I got I'm, into I'm, it's, I'm it's riveted. Story. <laughs> I'm, I'm riveted. Yeah. It's like, uh, give me five uh, decades, so anyway, or five minutes. I did that. Yeah. And while I was at AAUG, um, part of what bothered me about it was that they were Arabs living in exile, some of them, you know, and they were, the, the fights at the convention would be between the Ba'ath and the, the, the Nasserites or between the Jabhat Shabia and the Demokratia, whatever. And it was like, wait, I, that's not me. I wanted to change America, an American policy. So I started the Palestine Human Rights Campaign and Brahim and Edward helped me. Mm. Um, uh, we did it in the AAUG and then we broke away and they helped uh, me with the initial funding to get it going. Um, okay, then I'm off to the races. That's it. That's the yeah. that's the origin of my work. <laughs> so, um, what were if you were to look back at those years, right? The early '70s, sort of the post 1967 period, um, uh, in the states among this this sort of uh, milieu, right? What were some yeah. of the, the mistakes? Do you think that now, with wisdom and uh, hindsight, you can sort of look back and say, I wish we turned left when, when we turned right. I don't think I'd, I'd, I'd see any there. I mean, I, I think that everything that was done was a function of where we were as a community, um, what our capacity was. Um, and, and I think we did pretty well. Um, for example, you know, there, there are differences. Number one, look, we're, 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 we're looking at a community that it really wasn't still a community. Um, it was yeah. uh, because of the immigration patterns, you know, big immigration before World War I, frozen for about 30 years, nobody coming in because they got rid of, as Senator David Reed said, no more Syrian trash in America. Um, we were part of that South Mediterranean group that was excluded yeah, like the, the chinese were excluded the zeros uh, and so for 30 years no new no new blood and then all of a sudden in the 50s it starts up again and then after nasser and after the the 48 um uh after the nakba and after whatever then there was a flood of new refugees coming in a uh, new immigrants coming in and so the community had two problems one was generational um people who had been born here, uh, who had been here for 30 years without immigration, had been very assimilated. <clears throat> then all these, these new groups who were coming over for political uh, persecution reasons and who brought, in many cases, ideologies with them. Uh, yeah. Every group in the Arab world, from the Baathis to the, everybody was here. Um, and it was very complicated. And so when you had groups forming, they either were exile groups fighting the fight back home, uh, or they were sub-ethnic group ones, the Syrian this, the Lebanese that, the Palestinian this, the village this, the churches and the mosques, whatever. Yeah, of course. Um, it wasn't until the generation, um, my generation, the ones born here, um, came of age, that a generalized sense of being Arabic, uh, of you know, I, I'd see a kid in class and he kind of looked like me and he had a name that sounded a little like an Arab. And I'd say, oh, I bet you're, and they ate the same food and culture. There was this sense of coming together. I didn't, didn't know where they were from, whether Egypt or Lebanon or Syria or Jordan, what religion they were. It just seemed, it, you know, I used to say, unless the name's Muhammad or George, I don't know what religion people are. I don't ask. It's not like, uh, yeah. are you Muslim by any chance? You know, yeah. it's not what we do. So the, the, the community came of age late um, and for very obvious reasons. And then when we came of age, um, we faced a problem that maybe no other community uh, faces. And that is another group much more powerful than we were who wanted to snuff us out and saw us yeah. as a threat. Um, nobody else faced the problem of first starting to organize and come together, make a contribution to candidates and have the candidates return the money because people in the Jewish community said, you can't take money from them. Yeah, I heard they you tell work. a story. One of those stories, uh, you guys wrote a check after some big fundraiser and then they said, no, we can't take this. Yeah, yeah. So the, I, I, don't, I don't blame us 
Um, yeah. As much as I think that, you know, you, you know, when you see a, a, a one and a half year old start to get up from being on their knees and start to walk, you don't say, ah, look at, he can't do it right. Um, it's it's developmental. Uh, and yeah. I think we were in the stage of development and I'm pretty comfortable. We make mistakes now to be sure, but back then we were just finding our sea legs. And, um, and I think given the obstacles we faced, given the complexity of what this community represents, um, I, I think we've done really well. And yeah. I'm, I'm, pretty, uh, I'm pretty comfortable that, you know, like I said, we faced obstacles nobody else faced. Yeah. Nobody tried to deny us who we are. I mean, and still we, we look, uh, you, you know, Trader Joe's sells Middle East inspired Gibby balls. It's like, what the hell is that? You know, Middle East, do they sell Middle East inspired uh, spaghetti sauce? Uh, Middle yeah, exactly. East inspired this or that? Mediterranean? It, I think they call it Mediterranean inspired. What, what the hell does that even mean? Um, they cannot call it Lebanese. They cannot call it Arabic. They can't do it. And that is a hurdle that we face, like I said, that no other ethnic group has to face. Yeah. So um, if if the late 60s and early 70s are sort of like the the first couple years of this movement sort of coalescing and coagulating and sort of those were the toddler years, um, I've heard you describe mm -hmm. the, the moment where you get involved in Jesse Jackson's campaign as this coming of age moment. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us a little bit about uh, about that moment, how you got involved and um, why is this special? Well, I got to meet Reverend back in six, uh, 78, 79, when he was um, going to Arab events around, in Chicago mainly. Um, and then in, got, I got to know his chief advisor, Jack O'Dell, who became a, a mentor and extraordinary, extraordinary man. Um, the wise as 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 anyone I, I'd ever I'd ever dealt with in politics and in life. Um, and Jack told me he said, uh, uh, "Reverend's going to the Middle East and needs a briefing." He's going. It was it was a uh, after the Andy Young affair. Uh, was this when, when he Young went to got, go see Arafat? Yeah, when Andy Young got bounced at the UN because he'd met with the PLO guy. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I met with Reverend first time. We uh, hit it off. He went. Uh, he, he came to our Palestine Human Rights Campaign convention before he left. Um, huge uh, response from the community. Um, and then, you know, continued the relationship on and off. And then in 73, in 83, rather, we were having a, a, the anti-discrimination committee that I co-founded with former Senator Averest. We were having a convention. And he came, it was in LA, and um, he leaned over at one point and he said, uh, he said, man, he said, I want you to, I want you to come with me. He said, I'm running for president and I, I need you. Um, and I said, I said back to him, I said, Reverend, I, I spent four years building this organization. I just can't walk away from it. He said, man, you're going to do more in the next four months for your community than you did in the last four years. Well, I thought about it, talked to my wife about it, whatever, and decided to take a leave of absence at ADC and join him. And he turned out to be right. I mean, we, the, the, the energy that created in the community, the unity that it created in the community, the visibility that it gave the community um, was just beyond belief. It was the first presidential campaign to welcome Arab Americans. It actually helped us define the community as a community. Um, and in an interesting way, by the end of the campaign, I remember Jesse came to me at one point and said, he said, man, he said, your people made it. I said, what do you mean? He said, he said, every time we do a fundraiser, the papers would say the Arabs gave Jackson, the Arabs this. He said, we just did one in San Diego. There was no press coverage. He said, it's just becoming normal. Uh, and um, when, when the campaign was over, um, I had a falling out at ADC. It was a complicated situation and we were struggling for what to do and Edward, Said, and Brahim again came to my rescue and provided us with funding, a group of us, um, 
uh, with some funding to, to bridge until we figured out what we were going to do. And then we got the idea to why not continue what we had done with the Jackson campaign, that is to say, to do voter registration, uh, mobilization into political campaigns. In other words, to, to create a political empowerment project. And that was the birth of the Institute was uh, late 1984. We launched formally in 1985. Um, and that's, uh, that's where we are. So when you say that um, it helped define the community, what, what do you mean by that? Well, what I mean is that, look, there had been a Carter, um, uh, Syrian, Lebanese for Carter. There would, had been a Lebanese Americans for Reagan. Um, there'd never been an Arab American committee before in politics. Um, because like I said, if you gave money as an Arab American, you got it returned, right? It was like yeah. the Jewish community would go ballistic. And even in the Jackson campaign, I mean, people from the Jewish community met with Jackson and said, you keep working with the Arabs, you're going to lose support from, from, from us. Um, I mean, there, there were times when we'd apply coalition to get into coalitions in Washington and be excluded during the, the march celebrating the, in 83, celebrating the, the anniversary of Martin Luther King's speech. The Jewish organization said, if you let the Arabs in, we'll, we'll boycott it. Um, and there was a big fight then that emerged and we finally won. Um, but uh, being Arab American <laughs> had always, and, and therefore in, in reaction to that, some people in the community took what they felt was the path of least resistance. Don't call yourself Arab American, stay Lebanese or, or go with Christian or go with this or, or whatever. Um, and we, we, um, we had to push back we had to fight that and, and we won. And we won with Jackson. We were able to define ourselves as an inclusive, comprehensive community that would not be would not be excluded. And yeah. we're still facing the same challenges today. You know, it's, yeah. it's now become in some liberal circles, it's become um, politically convenient to be Muslim. Um, there's no issue attached to it other than you're the people that Donald Trump is picking on. So liberals sort of embrace it. But um, so you'll, you'll have five or six Muslims speaking at a national democratic convention. No one will ever talk about Palestine because that's taboo. An Arab American at the convention, it's like, who knows what, the, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, and, and you'll have the Syrian opposition to Assad or the Iraqi opposition to Saddam or the whatever. They'll also be acceptable. We keep pushing back at both those internal efforts to to sort of redefine the community um, and to separate and divide the community uh, and to continue to insist that it be seen as an ethnic group uh, that is unified around both our culture and heritage, but also around issues we care deeply about, one of which obviously is Palestine. And we'll never walk away from that. Um, yeah. Is there, um, how much success do you feel like uh, the Institute and the broader effort has had uh, linking those, those sort of different generations that ha have that sort of 30 year gap in the middle? Like I, when I think yeah, of- um, I'll, I'll tell you um, a, an example, um, no names mentioned, but very prominent Republican when we started, came to our founding convention uh, in 85 and- um, he was very influential in the party, and he kept he and a brilliant political thinker. Um, he kept talking about you people, what you people have to do, and what you people have to do, and what you. And like four years later, it's like what we have to do, and he's referring to himself as an Arab American. I figured we won, right? And uh, um, the 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 extent to which people do um, identify with that with the community seek the support of the community, want us to do fundraisers for them as a community um, in politics, that's, that's a win. Um, and um, uh, yeah, I, 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 feel, I feel pretty good. I look, I look at the hundreds of people who've gone through our institute and have become part of the Washington scene, working on the Hill, working at the State Department, working at the, had, you know, when, when I came to Washington, 
there were almost no Arab Americans in any of the groups, the ACLU or the Amnesty International, et cetera. Now, most of their staff dealing with Middle East issues, Arab American. We, we During the Clinton administration, there was a task force that we pushed them to create an interagency task force to deal with the problems the community was having. And the different agencies would get together and meet with the community. That uh, continued on um, until in the first couple of years of the Bush administration, it continued and we, we, we met. Then they switched um, the people at Justice who were convening it and it stopped. Didn't start up again until uh, the Obama years. <clears throat> and I remember uh, going to the first interagency meeting and there were all of us sitting around the table and then around the ringing around the room um, were all of the representatives from the different agencies. And as they introduced themselves, I was like, wait a minute, about half of the staff there uh, were Arab American. Uh, yeah. And about uh, um, a half of that half had been interns at my institute or had been okay. staff at the institute or, or at ADC. And I thought, we did it. You know, we, we created a, 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 a sort of a bridge between the community and public service and people walk that bridge um, and, um, and, are, and are there. And I, I you know, I, we, I think we've, we've done it. Uh, we had an event one time. I remember Arab embassies would always say, your people don't, uh, they don't, they need to work together. That was always the, the ambassadors would say, your community needs to work together. We did an event every year <coughs> called the, the Khalil Gibran uh, Spirit of Humanity, and we award people. When Queen Noor's dad, uh, Najib Halabi, uh, had, when he passed away, we created an award in his name for public service because he had served in the Kennedy administration, one of the first Arab Americans in a high level position like that. Um, went on to be the head, the, become the head of Pan American Airways, and then uh, then he was chairman for many years of, of Save the Children, um, an amazing man and a great supporter of our work. Um, so one year at the dinner, we gave the award uh, to an Arab American who had been an ambassador in three different countries. Um, the award was presented by a former congressman who was uh, now... Um, in the Obama administration, Secretary of uh, of Transportation, and um, when the, the at the end of the dinner, I always make some closing remarks, and I looked at the ambassadors and I said, "You've always lectured us on what we need to do to to come yeah. together as a community." I said, "Tonight, uh, we gave an award named after a Syrian American uh, to a Palestinian American, and it was presented by a Lebanese American." You couldn't do that anywhere in the Arab world. So don't tell us what we need to do. We're actually doing it. We're creating a community. Um, and we don't use the sub-labels. Um, we use the sense Arab American. And I, I, I feel good about it. So um, talking about uh, you know the idea that like we did it, right? Um, that's, that comes, that's basically what you're describing is more of quote unquote us around the table. At that at that at that event, right? Mm -hmm. More uh, Arabs in in uh, positions of power through government, um, and being able to represent themselves without having to sort of wash away that uh, that association. But in terms of um, actual sort of end product policy, what more do we have to do? Do you think? What are some of the the, the weakest muscles that we have to work on? Because Obviously, uh, there are tons of holes and tons of missteps and tons of problems if you think about sort of American foreign policy towards the Arab world um, over the course of the last 20 years. Um, what, what's next? What are the main things that you want to focus on over the next? Well, number one, changing American policy in the Middle East is not just our job alone. Uh, it's a collective responsibility of, of Americans. Um, and... Um, and we have allies in this, uh, allies that we didn't have. Um, there's, for example, uh, a growing awareness, I think, among liberals, progressives in general, um, that our policies in the region is screwed up. Um, in particular, there is a, um, a, a, a dramatic change 
taking place in the Jewish community um, with new groups emerging that have created space for a debate. Uh, the tyranny that once governed in Congress, the fear that, um, uh, I, I, I used to have a club, I, I'd call it the I'm really with you guys butt club. It was the members of Congress who'd come to me and whisper, uh, you know, I, I, I'm really with you, but you've you got to understand the, you know, whatever. And I, and said, yeah, okay, fine. You know, you're a coward. What am I going to do? Um, but number one, that's less and less right now. And, yeah. um, and number two, uh, there are groups in the Jewish community that have emerged that give those guys um, backbone and, and, and back them up when they come out. For example, I think one of the most interesting races this year that, that we've seen lots of progressives challenging incumbents um, and winning, sometimes losing, sometimes winning. APEC, literally in desperation now, has to create their own PACs to pour millions and millions of dollars to defeat progressives because they're scared of the, the new voices they bring to the policy debate. But maybe the most interesting race is in Michigan, where Andy Levin, who comes from the Levin family that is uh, uh, legendary in the state, I mean, his uncle's a senator, his father was a congressman for, for decades, uh, both of them. Uh, Andy wins that seat uh, years ago and uh, becomes a, a champion for peace um, and as legislation that in addition to, you know, stuff that I think is pablum, the two-state solution, whatever, I call it the two-state absolution. Uh, sort of, but he doesn't do it that way. He doesn't do it like, okay, I support two states, I'll leave me alone. He talks about in his bill that he wrote, conditioning aid to Israel based on um, their performance and, and whether they honor or violate human rights. Um, and he's got so many co I've never seen a bill of that sort with that many co-sponsors. I mean, it's maybe half or more of the Democratic uh, caucus in the House. Uh, it's huge. And, um, uh, and APEC has come out against him and is supporting somebody not Jewish um, who is towing their line. Um, it's creating a huge problem in the Jewish community, which is exactly good because they need to confront APEC directly on this stuff, and they're doing it. And, uh, and then in the country as a whole, there's a shift in mindset um, that is brought on, I and I think we still have to do the research on accounting for this, but, but it's partly demographic. I mean, it, it's young people, um, it's people of color, African-American, Latino, um, uh, Asian, um, with very different views of the world than white middle-aged, you know, uh, middle-income, born again, you know, whatever. Um, and and so there 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 are changes coming, and we're not the cause of that change. Um, and it's very late in coming, <laughs> but it is coming, and we're. We, we're part of the that wave, uh, and I feel good about that too. But um, where we've made a difference is in um, in small ways. Uh, small number one, you are no longer excluded from politics because you're Arab American. That's a big deal. Yeah, um, your ethnicity no longer is a liability. Uh, it can be an asset. That's that's a victory. We've won victories in civil rights. We've won victories in civil liberties. Um, we've put ourselves in positions where we can advocate for the community on these issues. And all of those are, are important. Um, we've won elected positions all across the country from, I mean, we now have 400 Arab American elected officials in positions of influence in their communities. The mayor of, um, Look, when, when, we, <laughs> when we first started in 85, two months in, get a desperate call from Dearborn. The guy running for mayor uh, was running on the platform what to do about the Arab problem. He'd send a tabloid out to people's homes with headlines like three inches high, what to do about the Arab problem. And it was about they're, they're dirty, they don't share our values and culture, 
and they're ruining our darn good way of life here in Dearborn. That was the quote. And uh, they were traumatized. I went up to Dearborn <clears throat> and um, spoke that night at a big rally. You're not the problem of Dearborn. You're the promise of Dearborn. 93,000 people in Dearborn. And 18,000 of them were Arab. Um, and 700 were registered to vote. That's it. Um, Jackson comes along uh, in 88, the 88 campaign, huge. We did voter registration. By the 90s, we're up to six, uh, we're up to 7,000 registered voters. That same guy comes to an institute event that we, we hosted up there, speaks a little bit of Arabic. My dear brothers and sisters gives me the key to the city. Um, a guy who was with me at the event from the, the, the Clinton White House, <laughs> he leans over and he says to me, he said, son of a bitch knows how to count, doesn't he? Yeah. You know, today in Dearborn, the mayor is Arab American, president of the city council is Arab American, the majority of the city council is Arab American, the state representative is Arab American, the police commissioner is Arab American. They're not just the promise of Dearborn, they are Dearborn today. And same in Patterson, New Jersey, the yeah. community was shunned 30, 40 years ago. Today, mayor is Arab American. They got Arab Americans on city council. They just renamed Main Street in Patterson, New Jersey, Palestine Way. Nice. The congressman who represents there, who would never talk about the issue at all, was the lead uh, sponsor of the letter uh, demanding an independent investigation into the murder of, uh, of Shireen Abu Akla. Yeah. I mean, there's real change here. And please, um, Dr. Zagwe, please tell me that you asked that guy on that stage. Um, so what are we going to do about the Arabs? <laughs> yeah. The, well, he, I, no, I didn't. Cause I don't, <laughs> uh, uh, you don't get any, you don't, you don't score any points in politics by insulting the, the newly, That's the newly converted. That's true. So like, let me, where, where, like, where you been, buddy? Yeah. Let me ask, let me ask you another question. Um, so given, given these successes and this track record, um, I wonder, have other folks from other communities globally reached out and said, Hey, listen, we're trying to build a uh, German American, uh, Germ Arab German association. We're trying to build uh, this type of thing in France. We're trying to build this type of thing in Brazil. You know, uh, we did, we did get approached by the, by French, um, years ago. Uh, but no, uh, it, it, the, the differences were, uh, were, were too great in terms of, look, America's different, uh, in terms of, we, we have our rough spots, but, um, but the conditions under which immigrants live here, I mean, in, in France, you can be three generations and you're still, you know, an Arab, you know, you're, you're, you're not part of, the, you're, you're still, you, Pakistanis can be in, in, in London for, for three generations, they're still immigrants. Um, and the same in Germany. Um, uh, you, you're here for 15 years and, and you're an American. And, um, and so I, we've got huge obstacles. And, and, and like I said, you know, people trying to uh, culturally appropriate um, our food and our music, um, and we're pushing back on that. But, um, um, but yeah, I think that other than that one experience with the, with the French group coming, no, what we have been doing, though, that I, I'm really proud of <clears throat> is um, we've, we've created a project with um, uh, elected officials uh, in Tunisia, Morocco, now Jordan, and hopefully moving on to Lebanon, where we pair up um, Arab American elected officials, young Arab American elected officials at different levels, with their cohorts in these countries. And our guys go to visit with them and then they come and visit to, uh, with us uh, and a mentoring relationship gets set up. We learn a lot from them and they learn a lot from us. Uh, that, that is more to the point of the contribution we make as a community that has somewhat matured 
and has people who are mayors and state legislators and Congress people and leaders in the Democratic Party um, where we can contribute some of what we know uh, to those who are in the region uh, getting started in the same way. And then they in turn can help us because look, a lot of our elected officials, young Arab Americans have never been to the region. This gives them a shot at learning about the Arab world and it gives uh, young emerging leaders in the Arab world a chance to learn about the work we do and, and, and how, you know, how we govern our cities and states. Yeah. Since, since you uh, do so much work in polling, I have a question about the ideological diversity of the Arab American community um, historically and what you sort of see coming down the pike. Because historically, my, you know, on my grand, on my maternal side, um, my great grandparents on my maternal side were all Arab immigrants that came from then Syria. Um, and on that side, when I think about my sort of grandparents, that generation, they're all Republican, right leaning um, conservatives. And that's true of that, almost everyone of that, uh, of that sort of age group, not everyone, but almost everyone, right? Um, I remember during when Trump was running, people in Lebanon who had a family in the States were befuddled that they had cousins who were voting for Trump. How could that possibly be true? So I'm curious, um, going forward, how much ideological diversity do you see among Arab Americans when you look at the entire, entire country and entire age spectrum? Uh, we polled, um, and I start here, let me say, I do polling in the Middle East. Yeah. My brother does the domestic polling. Um, and when it comes to Arab Americans, I, I've you know, worked with him on it. Um, <clears throat> but when he, when he, when we started polling in the 90s, uh, all the way through every two years, 92, 94, 96, 98, up to 2000, there was always the community leaned Democratic, always leaned Democratic, like every other ethnic group. Um, by lean, I mean um, 38, 34, 40, 36, you know, the, it was 4.5 point split, but leaning Democratic. Um, and lots of reasons for it. I mean, like the Italians, like the, the, the Irish that started off small business people, uh, labor people. I'm going to be going uh, in two weeks to Danbury, Connecticut, which was always a center of, of Lebanese immigration to raise the flag over City Hall, uh, the Lebanese flag over City Hall. And uh, 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 they have a lot of elected officials, Lebanese Democrats in Connecticut. Um, it's a great it's a great state and community for us. But um, um, but that's how the community emerged. Uh, it was in the, the kind of the ethnic politics of the, the 30s, 40s, 50s. That's the world I grew up in. Um, and then as they moved out to the suburbs, whatever, they got a little more conservative and wanted to protect their money and they became a little more Republican. Um, the, the Trump thing is a whole different reality. It's, that's another, another story. <clears throat> but what we saw in 2002 was after George Bush, uh, the gap started to open. Um, I think it was 42, 29, uh, in, in, um, in 2002, the gap continued to open in the last um, 12 years or so. <clears throat> I, I Maybe going back to the 2006 and eight, 2008, our numbers are more like Hispanic numbers, two thirds Democrat, one third Republican. Uh, and they stayed there. And the Trump thing didn't, uh, you know, there, the, yes, there was a hard core that stayed Republican and uh, uh, for reasons of all kinds um, felt that uh, he was um, uh, the answer to their prayers uh, for America and for the region. He was going to fight back against uh, uh, whatever. Um, but it never was more than a third. Uh, never was more than a third. And the community remains on the on the, the Democratic side of the ledger, like I said, in numbers that are more like Hispanic numbers and more like Jewish numbers uh, than they are like any other ethnic group. Hmm. Okay, 
Let's do a couple of quick questions and then we're going to open up to the audience. So rapid fire, sort of. Um, what are you reading or watching these days? <laughs> Nothing interesting. I uh, I spend so much time every day on uh, reading newspapers, journal articles, commentary on the Middle East and or on American politics. My stack is usually about that thick because I like to print them up. Um, yeah. And I spend hours reading all day. Any so any go to publication for enjoyment is um, um, mysteries, uh, yeah. uh, detective stories. I love the the Dashiell Hammett, uh, Rex yeah. Stout, uh, kind of the thirties, forties, fifties detective, the hard boiled detective crowd. Yeah. Um, and when I watch our old black and white movies, I love them. Those and the British. Um, you know, the British detective stories, uh, the, the, you know, I, I love uh, Anne Cleves, uh, Shetland, Vera, that kind of vintage. Yeah, that's cool. what I do. Amazing. Um, who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? I have no idea. <laughs> to be honest with you. No, I don't. You know, I don't. I don't think. Uh, I don't think there's anybody that uh, any childhood idols that you're like. Oh my god, that I intrigues me. Time. My childhood idols are all dead, unfortunately. Yeah. And they were both Duke Snyder, baseball player, Dodgers. Loved them. Sandy okay. Koufax, pitcher, Dodgers. Oh my god, I thought he was maybe maybe Steph Curry. I, I I guess if Steph Curry would let me follow him around, I would. I would gladly, gladly do that. Um, yeah. Re I, rebound for him? I uh, think he's, just, no, I'd, he'd do his own rebounds. Um, <laughs> I just sit there and watch mouth agape. I taught at Davidson for a little bit. Um, That's right. Um, yeah. My kids went to school there. Uh, I think he's a stunning athlete and just a wonderful, and his coach. Uh, of course, Kerr, Steve Kerr. Steve Kerr. Uh, whose dad was Malcolm Kerr. Is just an, an incredible person who's not only a great basketball mentor and coach, but also his politics are just marvelous. I I, uh, I agree. Uh, yeah. Okay. You're fine. That's it. I want to follow Steph Curry and I want to follow Steve Kerr. Yeah. Um, what do people most misunderstand about your work? Uh, I think that <clears throat> there are those who think that I'm just uh, obsessed with, um, with Israel. Um, and I'll get that criticism. You're an anti-Semite because all you think about is Israel. And i like, no, not really. I mean, and, and when I do get obsessed about Israel, it's because Israel keeps making me obsessed. I mean, <laughs> if they didn't do shit, I wouldn't be paying attention so much. I mean, yeah. when they start demolishing the homes of people, when they start you know, um, uh, shooting people, um, in some cases randomly, when they start confiscating land, uh, when they threaten the peace and stability of the whole region, I'm going to pay attention, right? So yeah, that's the, that's the, uh, I think that they, they think I'm obsessed with it just because I'm obsessed with it. I'm not, I'm obsessed with it because they keep doing stuff. Uh, I remember I was on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom Obama appointed me, and there were, I think there were uh, seven of us on the <clears throat> commission, some appointed by the White House, some appointed by Congress, and, uh, or maybe nine, I think nine of us. And um, the, <laughs> uh, for years, I was on for four years, and I was vice chair for two of them. Uh, I didn't raise the issue of, of, of Israel, um, but in the last year, we had prepared a whole document uh, with a group of lawyers and a, a Jewish member of the commission and I raised it and said, we have to look at Israel's violation of religious freedom. Um, we had condemned 27 countries every year, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, others, you know, for their, their violations. And um, the commission, the Republicans struck back with vengeance saying, you're just obsessed with Israel. And why do you single Israel out for criticism? And I said, guys, I, I'm not singling Israel out for criticism. I just voted on 27 countries that we were gonna condemn for religious freedom violations, many of them in the Arab world. You're the one singling Israel out as the one country you can't criticize. 
So I don't think that they misunderstand as much as they're just, they, they, they just want to operate with impunity and have no one ever criticize them for it. Uh, yeah. that, that I think is the, it's not a misunderstanding as much as it is fear, a, a kind of a fear-driven paranoia that don't criticize us, don't criticize Israel, um, and you're doing it, you must have a problem. No, you got the problem because you won't see the, you know, the, the, the problems that exist there. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, yeah. Okay, the <clears throat> last one is, um, I'm sure there's a long list, but um, is there anyone whose work you uh, admire and are sort of constantly inspired by in or outside of your profession? This is going to sound weird, yeah. But my children. Um, my son is uh, chief counsel in the Judiciary Committee. Um, extraordinary, um, extraordinary work that he does in civil rights, civil liberties, immigration reform, the Dream Act, uh, helping. He is so motivated to to help those dreamers. Uh, um, my daughter works with uh, disabled uh, community and. And it's just, just a fierce fighter for, for rights. Um, another daughter works with an education foundation and does her work in one area, but if they step out of line, um, she's just amazing. Uh, another son is a lawyer, an environmentalist, um, and passionate about it. And my baby uh, is a school teacher now for uh well over a decade i think about 18 years and uh she uh i don't know anybody who cares more about uh, kids uh disadvantaged kids in particular um and and has the capacity and the ability to bring the best out of them and i i just love watching them and i marvel at the work they do and and um, um, it's just it's a it's a great feeling when you can see that that you know my 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 wife and I have produced people who surpassed us in in the contributions that they'll make uh, to to making the world better. Um, Amazing, uh, I'm sure I'm sure that means a lot to them. Um, I'm curious, have they ever? Um, uh gently criticized a point of view or of yours maybe not criticized but sort of interrogated a point of view of yours that helped <laughs> you put the twitter you put the twitter uh thing up yes when i was on when i first got on twitter i was like well this is fun you know this is back in i it says here that i on there it said that i started in 2011 i actually didn't i didn't I, the office created that account in 2011. I think the first tweets I did were in 2015 or 16, around when Bernie was running. And, um, uh, and you know, there is a, a, you know, a certain mindset when you get into 100 and back then it was 140 characters. And I could be as snarky as anybody. I mean, and yeah. at one point, my kids all got together. It was Christmas and they were all here at the house. And they had an intervention, you know, the way somebody would have an intervention with somebody on drugs or somebody with alcohol. Um, and it was my middle son, Matthew, who put it this way. He said, because uh, I was pushing back. Um, yeah. and, and he finally said, Dad, listen, um, when, when I know you're going to be on television, I tell all my friends to watch you because I know that what you'll say will be thoughtful. It'll be intelligent. And it'll make me proud. Um, he said, I feel the same way about your Twitter stuff. He said, it's snarky and it's mean. And it's, you get down into the gutter with the people you're, you're and it was like, it's stung, you know? And yeah. um, I, uh, I changed and I don't do it anymore. And every once in a while, early on, they would, uh, you know, after the, the first intervention, <laughs> they'd say, dad, take that down. And I'd take it down. And now I have a, uh, I have a kid-driven filter. Um, I, I think, what will my kids think of this one? Or what will they think of that one? And when they call me and they tell me I like that one, um, then I feel good about it. So yeah, I am, um, um, they, they, have, they have been critical and, and it's made sense and it's helped me. Very cool. Well, Dr. Zogby, um, 
I could listen to you for hours and hours, and I have tons more to ask you. But we oh, run and I could time. talk for hours and hours. <laughs> Well, if uh, you're just listening to this and you're not uh, looking at the screen, um, we have up the uh, the Twitter account, the aforementioned Twitter account, which is JJZ1600. Uh, and there is an email address if you'd like to email Dr. Zogby and ask any questions. Uh, you can reach him at jzogby at aaiusa.org. Um, this was a real pleasure. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Thank you.